Good evening, all. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am Shreeli Kapale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Community Engagement. May is Asian American and Pacific Islanders Heritage Month. During the congressional hearing in 1992, in which then New York Republican Congressman Frank Horton introduced the bill that called for May to get that designation. He made a point of singling out a woman. Her name was Jeannie Jew. She was a former Capitol Hill staffer who had first ap approached Horton about the idea in the mid 1970s, more than 15 years earlier. The ancestor of Ms. Jew, M.Y. Lee, was a Chinese immigrant on the transcontinental railroad who believed that the country's bicentennial celebrations had not adequately celebrated the contributions of Asians and Pacific Islander Americans. Just like the way one woman made a difference and was instrumental in bringing about a month dedicated to Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage Americans. Today, my guest, Shee Van Fleet, changed the narrative as one woman in the media about critical race theory. To honor this month, this week, I invited Shi Van Fleet. She's a local hero, she's my hero. She became famous overnight after she gave a speech at the Virginia Loudoun County School Board meeting past June. In that speech, she spoke about critical race theory as something that is rooted in cultural Marxism, and said that the division it has caused is like an American version of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. When she Van Fleet, a Loudoun County mother, pushed back against critical race theory at a heated Loudoun County School Board meeting, her words carried special weight. The more you we talk to she, the more we'll rea we will realize why her words were so powerful. She's an immigrant from China who, as a child, had lived through Mao's Marxist Cultural Revolution. She, we are fortunate to have you here today. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, she, there is so much to talk about today, starting from your upbringing in Mao's cultural revolution to you being vocal about the current American revolution in pretty much all the mainstream media platforms. Start off by telling your childhood and your journey to this great nation. Okay, yeah, I was, uh, um, of course, born and grew up in Mao's China. And I was uh, six turning uh, seven when the Cultural Revolution started. I spent my entire school years doing the Cultural Revolution. And I learned very little, but the witness that uh, uh, unbelievable event in human history. And after I graduated from a high school, I was sent to the countryside as all those uh, urban uh, youth to be re-educated by the peasants for three years. And uh, after Mao died, I was able to go to college through the examination. And I was accepted because of my qualification, because of my own ability. And so I studied English and later become a teacher in the, uh, in, in the teacher training college. And that's where I met my American friend who came to teach in our college and she helped me to get assistantship to come to um, study English in America. That was 1986. Wow, wow. She, what a powerful story. I'm sure you still remember your American friend that kind of inspired you to come to America. I always say, that I've met quite a few American friends when I was uh, doing my college in uh, Manipal, uh, Mangalore. It's a state in, uh, in India. And I was always in awe with the generosity and openness of Americans. I've seen a lot of foreign nationals, but Americans in specific were stuck in my mind because of their generosity, their transparency, their openness and so on and so forth. Uh, she thanks for uh, sharing your childhood story and your journey to America. So how did you end up going to the school board meeting that particular day where it all began? I mean, well, what yeah. motivated you? Were you? Was your son or child or daughter in? Uh... It's everything. It's everything. Okay. It's not overnight decision. And I have been noticing that the things were going in the wrong direction for a long time. I can remember 
probably going back more than 10 years, uh, many, many troubling signs and started with a kind of a seemingly harmless political correctness. And then that is uh, progress into the uh, uh, taking away our freedom of speech that we can't see this, can't see that. And then, um, you know, uh, you, you, you can see that the media is gone. Our academia is gone and they are all controlled by the radical left, but it was 2020 that became the turning point to me and I bet to many, many people. And so it was no longer subtle. What we saw on the streets of the riots reminded me vividly of what I saw when I was a little girl in China. And instead of uh, being BMM and TIFA and social justice warrior, they were the red guards. So I know this is no longer uh, something like a troubling sign here and there. It is in our face. I have to step up. I have to speak up. And that's my motivation. And that's how I got involved. She, you are, you are truly an inspiration. And I tell people that people that have seen you in interviews understand you're very authentic. You're speaking from experience. If people don't learn when immigrants are coming out uh, courageously and telling their stories, I'm not sure what will make people open their eyes. But also for those of you that don't know she, you might have really thought this was a very small thing to do, or you probably don't even remember. You're a very loving and caring and tender person. After the second time I met you, you brought your home uh, uh, home garden vegetables to one of the event and gave it to me. <laughs> uh, I know a lot of people don't think much of it. That just tells me that no matter how courageous you are, you're not one of those persons that don't care for norms. You do care for norms and you want to protect those values uh, in this society. So I have a lot more respect not because you gave me vegetables, but that just showed me that you really care for people around you. You care for America. You care for this great nation. So she, I am always very fascinated with Chinese culture. It's a great culture and great uh, history and heritage. It's uh, one of those ancient countries. But for those of our viewers that might not understand the depth of what the great proletarian cultural revolution was, uh, Please take a few minutes to provide a synopsis. I mean, I had to read up a whole lot, but I'm just not sure if everyone will take the time at this point. We have a lot going on in our lives. So it'll be great if you can talk about that. I will try my best. It is complicated, but I'll try to make it short. So the uh, CCP took over China in 1949. After that, they had one political campaign after another. And we, those were all mini cultural revolutions. One of the uh, big disaster was um, took place in late in uh, from 1959 to 62. The reason is Mao pushed his radical policy of uh, great great leap forward, and I just don't have time to get, get into it. But the result was that up to 40 million Chinese died of starvation. And that was a great failure of his radical policies. After that, there's a pushback within the party and uh, a lot of people started to question his leadership and uh, he was sidelined for, because of that, even though he was still had his title and he did not like it. As a dictator, he could not tolerate that. So he, he planned a comeback and that was the great proletarian cultural revolution. What he wanted to do? Very simple, power. How to do it? Um, that was his, uh, always, that's his strategy. Uh, mobilize the masses, get, uh, seize power from below. And his tactics is to get rid, actually it is a war against his own system, his own communist system because he wanted to get rid of everyone in power thinking they are not loyal to him. In order to do that, he is going to have this revolution that will destroy everything, destroy the Chinese uh, um, Asian history and destroy the system that he personally uh, implemented for one thing, power. And that's what's going on here. People yeah. have to understand. 
Wow, wow. She, I mean, when you're talking about it, it just gives me chills, right? To what extent people can go to gain the power. It's um, very, very sad. Uh, so uh, she, you, in the beginning of the sessions, you started talking about Marvel's Red Guards. Um, it's my understanding when I read a little more about it, their goal was to abolish land, law enforcement. And then the Chinese saw violence, rioting, looting, burning, and they also launched a great cancer culture and they wanted to cancel everything that was in communism. Oh, she, oh my, the parallels that you draw from that to what just happened in 2022. It just truly gives me chills. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, to understand what Mao wanted to do and what the left wanted to do, they want to destroy the system because the system is in their way to gain complete and absolute power. So in China, what, uh, uh, how did uh, Mao start his revolution? The youth, the mm. indoctrinated youth. Do you know where the Red Guard started? In high school, wow. in high school. So those are the high school kids started Red Guards movement and eventually is spread out to the whole country, colleges, and eventually other people that are not in school joined, just like here. And the uh, on campus, they have these radical ideologies and eventually spread out to the, uh, to the uh, larger society. And what they want to do, destroy everything. Destroy everything because Mao said, you need uh, to have the rebellion. <coughs> First thing they did, get rid of uh, law enforcement. And they told, excuse me. No, oh, please, please take your time. Yeah, they, um, they ordered the policemen away from campus. They were not allowed to go into campus. And if the Red Guards hit them, they were not allowed to hit back. So basically Mao openly support the Red Guards and give them free hand. And as young people so indoctrinated because all the educational system has been taken um, uh, by the uh, CCP. So what they did is they went after their teacher first. Wow. And the first killing in China during the Cultural Revolution was done by teenage girls, the first killing. They killed their assistant principal. And those girls were just a group of like 15, 16 year old. And then after that, it spread all over the country during the Cultural Revolution, it's estimated, you never get a figure in a communist country, but up to 20 million people died. Yeah, she, I, mean, I mean, the more you speak about that thing, the more, uh, there is so much parallels. I mean, just the sentence you said, the first thing they did is take police officers out of schools. Uh, I just heard it in the radio that they're looking into that right here, even in Fairfax County, wow. that they really don't want to have police officers and uh, oh my, oh my, I'm sorry if I cut you off. I really want you to finish. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's just as scary. And now I kind of know why you feel so, uh, you, you, you kind of feel like you have to get out and say whatever it takes, whatever modem. I wish millions of Americans would listen to you. I mean, it's literally scary. So she, one of the things that I, I am actually very, very enthused about is religious liberty. I think it is one of the most critical topics facing policymakers and leaders today. I come from a country where we value religious liberty, and I think it must be the topic that we, we can all agree upon. Um, so I believe uh, religious liberty is a God-given right, right? So during the Cultural Revolution, it's my understanding that Mao's Red Guards basically canceled Chinese traditional culture, which I consider it as a rich ancient culture, and pull down any statue that is Buddhist or that is not communist. And as you know, Buddhist kind of uh, originated from Hinduism. So yeah, India, yeah. Mm -hmm. we consider Buddha as one of our gods. So one of the mm -hmm. temples, largest temple in Northern Virginia has a Buddha statue. In fact, uh, I, I think it is my it was my life's privilege to be part of uh, uh, installation of uh, Buddhist. Uh, we don't even call it a statue because we consider that as a sacred thing. We call yeah. it as a life view. So it's uh, so they burned down the temples, they burned down the churches here and pulled down the statue statues here too. It happened yeah. right in the neck of our neighborhood. And they change, they're still changing the names of schools. They're spending millions do, 
doing that there. Uh, and even they're changing the personal names. Another, again, another parallels we can draw. Is this, um, I guess my question of all uh, saying about religious liberty, all of that is, is this discussed within Chinese community? I mean, uh, is it just you or are there a lot of people that if in Chinese community know this, understands, but are afraid to speak about it? Uh, I, I think that that is uh, interesting that somehow mm, a lot of people um, consider me an uh, oddity, like, oh, someone you know, come up and speak out. There are so many Chinese in Northern Virginia. There are so many in Fairfax. And, uh, and uh, many, many of them experience exactly what I experienced, or maybe worse, maybe their family member um, perished during the Cultural Revolution. And uh, um, yeah, I just hope more people will speak up. At the same time, I hope more Americans will reach out to your Chinese neighbors and coworkers and ask them. Every family has a story to tell about the Cultural Revolution. And uh, so, but a lot of young people are not learning it. And when I talk about the Cultural Revolution, sometimes I thought it's kind of funny. Like I'm, a age, like I'm an antique talking about some kind of Asian history. It's no, it not that happen that long ago. It was in I know people don't, young people don't know in China, not here, of course. That's a, that's a I, danger. I must admit, she, I think I partly blame us too as parents. I think we have to do a better job of talking. I think one thing that I try to tell my kids is uh, coming from immigrant background, I see when socialism, Marxism, and communism is playing before my eyes. And I keep insisting, uh, insistently tell my uh, kids that when India got away from socialism is when India started developing. Um, when there was no entrepreneurship and there was governmental dicta dictatorship, when there was that eliteness and common man division, I said country never grew. But when the free trade hap uh, happened, limited government happened, focus on entrepreneurship happened, that's all our Republican principles, then the economy started opening up and the opportunities started opening up. So um, I wish a lot of younger generation would listen to you. You have been very vocal in major television uh, shows. In one of the television shows, she, I heard you saying, which I thought was very powerful and it stuck by me, where you said CRT is indeed, uh, CRT for those of you that are not familiar, it's critical race theory, is indeed the American version of the Chinese cultural revolution. If you think about it for younger generation, probably they think it's a pretty strong radical statement. I don't think actually it is a radical statement. I think it's a pragmatic statement. So tell to our younger generation how this critical race theory has a its roots in cultural Marxism. I really yeah. want uh, this to be heard by our younger generation. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I, I just want to say I'm very active in Twitter. I learned how to tweet lately and I tweeted something out about cultural revolution and someone made a comment and I thought it was so true. He said, in school, we learned, never learned communism, never learned um, anything about what the communists did. All we learned is slavery and the Nazi. It is so true that communism was not taught here. So many people do not know. That's why they can recognize when we, uh, people who experience communism can see right away, this is communism, but they don't know and then you can recognize it. So why I compare CRT to a cultural revolution and during the cultural revolution, if you want to summarize it, it is the mass movement by Mao to set people into groups and against each other. So in China, how they divide people? They divide people into two opposing groups, black and red. Wow. Okay, so just a different color. Here we divide people black and white or yeah. anyone in between. So how did the, uh, the Mao divide people into red and black? Is black class are the people who are either used to be property owners or who were considered anti-revolutionary or who were considered not loyal to Mao. And once you are in that group, you are the enemy of the people, of the state. 
and then all this indoctrination taught the young people. Once the people are become class enemy, they're no longer human. They are absolutely some, something to get rid of. Any means necessary. That's why you can see why those little girls can kill their teacher, can kill their principal, because their principals were called class enemies. We're doing exactly the same thing here. We divide people using Marxist ideology. We divide people by race. That you just don't just divide them, see them against each other. Yeah, it's a divide and rule, she you explained it very well. I think CRT promotes far more racial division than racial sensitivity. So when I talk yeah. to my liberal friends, I know they keep saying, but you have to be sensitive to the race. I said, 100%, I agree with you, but there is no reason to have a divided race just to be sensitive to the race. And also she, like you said, much of CRT curricula distorts America's history. I think you started mm -hmm. off saying that they focus so much more on, uh, they don't speak about, um, they speak about slaves, but they don't speak about communism, China, Chinese revolution. And I think um, uh, they distort America's history and its progress by the inclusion of incorrect narratives surrounding the 17th century introduction of slavery. But they conveniently omit the accomplishments of uh, Martin Luther King and the accomplishments of civil rights movement of the 20th century and how far we have come along, which, it, uh, which I think is uh, on purpose for by any means. But no, thank you so much for kind of talking to our younger generation. I, I wish more of them realize that. So uh, she let me ask you something. I think too many Americans have no idea what is really going on. In fact, I just had a comment uh, that um, in Facebook, as you know, it is Facebook Live. I had one of the viewers saying that not a lot of Americans or even in fact, Chinese Americans um, uh, don't speak about it and don't know about it. Why do you think that immigrants such as you and me can clearly see, see through this mess? Is that because uh, Americans have never been taught that uh, crimes of communism, even in colleges? I know they don't teach in schools, uh, but even in colleges, I thought colleges had a place to kind of learn history in detail. Yeah, it's everything. Like uh, um, the left controls um, uh, Hollywood. So you don't learn anything from there. And they control media. They control academia, and then now they are trying to control and very successful of K through 12. So where do people get information? They control all that. And that's a major problem. And that's why I'm getting involved. This is now my mission to educate American people that yeah. what we're dealing with is, uh, uh, is Marxism and is, uh, uh, communism. And uh, I'm telling you this not because I read some books. No, I'm telling you this is because using their term, the lived experience, that's how I uh, uh, educate people. This happened to me before in China. It is happening right now to me in America. That's why I know it. I live through it. So I hope people pay attention. Absolutely. She, you were named after the city of Xi'an, right? Mm -hmm. But yes. your name is also the Chinese character signifying the West with implication of Western imperialism. Did you have pre peer pressure to change your name while you were in China? So, I know. And the people, were, yeah, when people say, this is what's going on, what's going on? That's uh, those uh, social justice warrior want to change names here and change them there. That all happened in Cultural Revolution. They change street names, store names, school names, even personal names. And I was, uh, my, uh, I was really worried about my name because West also refers to the Western imperialism. And uh, <clears throat> my friends started to call my names and I want to change it into East, which means mm -hmm. revolutionary. Fortunately, my mom said, just tell them it's from the city. It's nothing to do with imperialism. That's how far uh, uh, extreme that uh, uh, we went during the Cultural Revolution. And it's repeating right here, street, uh, um, street names, right? The uh, highway names and school names and even military base. And we're going there and change them. 
Wow, she, wow. I mean, it's just like for you, it's like a playbook. You can literally tell what's yeah. going to happen. If we go this way, you, you can t uh, practically tell people what's going to happen in five years. Yeah. So she, I, I know you can draw some parallels with the student equity ambassador program uh, and the bias reporting system that we have, uh, witnessing between students and teachers turning against each other. Can you elaborate on that too? Okay, that is uh, a feature in cultural evolution that I never dreamed to see it happen here, but it's happening. So uh, in the cultural revolution, we're all encouraged to report on each other. Parents and the children against parents, even parents against children wow. and neighbors against neighbor, friends against coworker, everyone, basically you mobilize the whole mass and uh, ask them or demand them watch each other. So there are stories of uh, children report on their parents. There is a famous story of this 15 year old boy uh, reported his mother to the authority because his mother made a comment about Mao at home. She wow. got executed. And I was just reading a story of a parent reported that his son joined a club that was not communist. As like they're talking about something that was they're not supposed to talk about and reported his son and he got executed. And the neighbors against neighbors. And that is something I thought would never happen in a free country. And it is happening everywhere. It's barely 2020. You remember those little girls went to a social media and called their parents racists. And then Biden said, call out your, uh, your, uh, your neighbors and your friends who uh, uh, have uh, um, um, extreme views. And it's just chilling. It is absolutely chilling. And what this it do is um, actually what happened after the Cultural Revolution, the trust among people was so much damaged and Chinese even today have trouble just trust just anyone, no, they, they take a long time for them to, gain, to, 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 to trust anyone because the story and the lessons was just too much that you don't just trust anyone. She, uh, I am glad you said this something because uh, every, uh, I, I ran for an office, it's been a while, it's been close to three, four years. And uh, I used to do extensive door knocking in Sully district. So as I door knocked, I realized that Koreans would open the door um, I mean, uh, any other ethnic group or just people in general open the door, but I've kind of noticed particularly my Chinese neighbors were always hesitant to open the door. And I didn't think much of it, but I, I couldn't help but ask my husband saying that I'm just not sure what I'm doing wrong. My Chinese community members don't open the door for me. Um, and that's when my husband explained, saying that think about the mistrust they have in politics, policy making, government with each other, with all the things that. And so I, I could put two and two together. Now, while you're saying, I'm like, ta-da, yes, now I know it. But so it, it's a it's mistrust. Happened here. Yeah, it, it worked. Now, you know, uh, when I was uh, at work and we were called to call out those who make racist remarks, what does that do? That's, you know, people start watching each other and report each other. And yeah. do you think that there will be a trust there? No, there won't be any trust because you always watch out for whatever who might report you. So she recently, I think uh, even President Biden um, and uh, uh, some of the politicians were saying that if you belong to one, uh, the President Trump's camp or tent, uh, you're all radical extremists, which is kind of laughable because I mean, I'm just a regular mom that supported his policies. Uh, I get up every day, work 12 hour days, try to do whatever what I have to do things right. So I think that's what is called as pitting, right? Pitting politics. Yeah. So she, what else we immigrants can do? I always say it's good to talk about problems. It's always great to talk about origins and how it started. But what can we immigrants do to tell Americans that it is indeed a privilege to be living here in America? I don't think a lot of Native Americans believe that or understand yeah, that. Because that's what they were taught. 
they were that told. this country is a racist country, is a evil country. Yeah. But also, I think they're thinking they're doing the right thing to be uh, be against racism. It sounds really good. I mean, I want to sound good too. I'm a nice person. There's no reason for me to be a racist. But they're basically breaking the system that is against racism. I think this system is set up to break the racism, but by uh, them doing the things that they're doing, they feel like they're doing great things. But I just don't know how to help them understand. Okay, I, I think, yeah, it's very important. We can talk about problems, but we should also talk about solution. Then to me, one of the things we can do is, uh, the first thing we can we should do is understand the nature of um, the problem. We are really at a war. It's a cultural war. It is between Marxism and American principles. And it's really a matter of life and death. And we'll talk about it a little bit, right? <coughs> so take your time. Yeah, yeah. The next thing, resist. We have to resist it. And so I, I, I think what we need now is courage. And we, um, and each one of us just show a little bit to resist. That will become non-stoppable force. How to resist? You don't have to go along. You don't have to be like me going, which happened to me and then I did not make it happen. It just happened. That I go to TV or whatever. You don't have to do that. You resist by not participating. And then you resist by questioning. And um, so I just heard my husband say that um, they had a meeting and they're talking about to get more people. Um, one minute. No, please, please. Take yeah, because they, they are having, um, they're going remote completely. So they're going to make sure their meeting is good for everyone <coughs> for whatever reason. <coughs> This HR person have to say, in order to achieve meeting equity, we need to do this and this and this. And here is the problem. Why would she even use that term, equity? That is an absolute Marxist term. And you can just question, what do you mean meeting equity? Just kind of innocently. I mean, it's just, when you see things, you resist and you question. And if there's so many questions, and then I think we, if not get over it, we're slowing it down. And that's what we need. We need courage. The courage can be small, can be big, but we all need a little bit of courage because understand what's in the stake is if we want to keep America the, 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 uh, the way we, we thought it is, right? We came here for the freedom, for the opportunities, for American dream, if you want to keep it for our children and children's children, we have to have some courage. Absolutely. Uh, she, I mean, you couldn't have said it better. I always say we can sit and talk about the problems. We know communist infiltration is almost complete. There's no place we don't see it. School, military, workplace, it's just everywhere. It's everywhere. everywhere. And I think unless we have the courage, and I say this in our leadership meetings all the time, uh, it is okay to question. It is okay to show the courage. It is okay to resist. Uh, we are all in it together. We want this country to continue to thrive. Go ahead. Can I say something else? And uh, just think about it. Um, let's say 10 years ago, if you see something that somehow the left did not like, they probably call you a racist and you probably get shunned or whatever. And think about today. If you were labeled as a racist, you may lose your job. You may lose your business. So what's next? If we still don't resist, the next that you may lose you freedom. And if we still don't speak up, the next thing is you may lose your life. So understand if we don't resist what the consequence might be. Absolutely. So resist today. 
uh, resist today. I think uh, that should be the motive. <laughs> resist, question, have the courage, be loving, yet resist. <laughs> So uh, she, um, I mean, I think um, I'm a working mom. I have a kid in school, so I have skin in the game. So I feel like the job of teachers and schools should be straightforward. I don't want to analyze it and make it that simple, but I think the teacher's responsibility is to train students to achieve competence in the basic subjects of reading, writing, verbal, math, science, history, and geography. It's yeah. as simple as that. Call me old fashioned. That's all I, I send my kids to school. Yet, according to our latest nation's re report card, only 23% of 12th grade public school students in America reach basic proficiency. That is 23%. Shay. It's not 2%. It's not 3%. So with our na nation's public school system failing in its primary mission, there is really, I don't think, any justification of diverting our resources and manpower from essential education curriculum and teaching a controversial program called CRT. I'm like, put the resources where it belongs. If you think our African-American children are failing, let's go ahead and get put all the resources in their education. But there is no reason to kind of pit each other. What, what, what do you think? Am I oversimplifying that they need to just focus on what I just said? Well, uh, I have to say that um, that's by design. And that's exactly what happened during the Cultural Revolution. All the uh, uh, exams were uh, uh, banned. We don't have, we hardly learn anything. In order to go to college, your qualification has to be you are from uh, the red class that you were recommended by party leaders. And you can go to college, even if your education was just elementary uh, education, because they were not concerned about academia, uh, academic sex, Excellency, they talk. They are concerned about having people that they uh, that will obey to CCP, obey to Mao, and that's all they're concerned about. Same here. They're not concerned about whether those uh, kids should learn something that will help them to succeed in life. No, their concern is have them indoctrinated so they can control them. <clears throat> Same thing. I think that that's what we need to understand. This is a really, really um, difficult battle because we already lost so much. And so the teachers and they say, people say, well, okay, just teach math. Yes, they can teach math and teach CRT at the same time. And they can teach just, just counting. They counting one, two, three, they're going to put query, uh, query theory in it. And that's what happened is that all these teachers have, have, have been through, they, have, they come through the pipeline of the Marxist uh, academia. And we have a really serious problem in our hand. And so this, I always tell people, don't think it's something we can fix just because we put someone in the White House, we take over um, Senate and the House, no. This is, a, um, this is a battle that has to be fought on every level, on the local level, on the individual level. And we have to detox the mind of those people that have been indoctrinated. So it will be, uh, I'm sorry, but it will be a tough battle. Battle. It's an uphill battle. She, you have your work cut out <laughs> for the next thirty years. You have to be speaking on a daily basis. So let me let me focus a little more on Chinese community, she, which I have tremendous respect. Uh, I think they are the most hardworking community. Uh, obviously, very intelligent, very hardworking. Even kids. I mean, they are doing uh, everything right just to kind of get ahead in life. I mean, I've had small business owner friends, so I really have tremendous. Um, Tremendous love for that community. Uh, uh, my question to you is uh, why, but why are so many Americans willing to sell our country for the CCP money? I mean, what is it? Uh, why is that happening? I, and um, I have the same question. I have the same question. A lot of people um, condemned CCP and I'm one of them. But I think uh, an, a lot of the real problem is here. CCP can't just come here, grab your, uh, um, uh, information or technology or trade uh, secret. We have too many people are willing to sell America and get paid by CCP. We have <coughs> Harvard uh, or MIT uh, professors willing 
to sell the give the uh, CCP secret, just get paid for that. And that's our problem. Our politicians, look at our politicians. How many of them have CCP money? And that's a major problem. Yeah. CCP have been exporting corruption wow. all these years and they are very successful. They corrupted our uh, politicians, our uh, um, intellectuals and our um, well, corporate leaders. Yeah, wow, 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 Shri. I mean, I wish uh, you, you get a chance to speak in the House of Representatives on legislation so you can actually speak up about this. Um, this might be a naive question, Shri, but I had it in my mind for a while. Forgive me if you don't want to answer. I, I actually have installed WeChat myself. I'm not sure. I'm sure. I hope you uh, kind of use the WeChat, the, the Chinese messenger app. Uh, but from my understanding, they think that the information could actually get to the Communist Party and could get the. But some of my friends said this, Chinese American friends, that whatever they put in WeChat could actually be traced back by the Communist Party and they could get their loved uh, ones uh, back home in Jeopardy. We are living in 21st century. I, I honestly couldn't believe that's real. Is that real or is it just a myth? 21, uh, 21st century has nothing to do with uh, um, oh, like a progress. We should be, oh no, this is a wrong thing to do. As long as we have communism here in this world, that's going to happen. So it is and true. It is true. Of course it's true. Wow. Every piece of data that um, CCP <coughs> can get hold of, it has it. Okay. Every piece of data. Yeah, yeah, wow. So and what's the same thing here? Yeah, no, that's what is happening. I mean, uh, I, 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 that's what I said. I don't want to come across naive to say information is not being uh, saved and sold by all these major digital platforms. But uh, when my friend said, oh boy, I won't type that because my loved one could get, uh, it just it didn't sound real to me, but I'm glad you confirmed that that could potentially happen. Uh, she, I mean, as we are coming to the last few minutes, um, I'm sure as a Chinese American, you have some Chinese American friends within the community. I know there are huge study groups and all of that. Does all of this come up in the conversation? If so, how do you guys handle it? Um, I, I think uh, every community has a, um, a kind of divided. America is so divided right now. I would say probably the whole history of the United States. <coughs> so is every community. And I know that the Indian community is same. And uh, in Chinese community, I have friends who share exactly um, how I feel. And they're very involved and they know what's going on. Uh, and, uh, and if we don't do anything and they know the consequence. Yet there is the other side and uh, they just bought into this victim ideology. I, I don't know how, but they did. They came here, they bought this idea. Now you are, you are minority, you are marginalized, you are just Asian and you need our protection. We are the, uh, uh, we are the savior, we are the democratic party that protect you. And they bought into it. And that's unfortunate, but that's the reality. And so, yeah, so I have to say the victim ideology is very powerful. You can be so successful. You can be absolutely have your American dream here as an immigrant, and yet you can be convinced you're a victim. Yeah, so she, I am it's very proud of you, first thing. I've seen both sides of uh, comments on Facebook Live uh, where people don't agree with what you're saying, but there are people that agree with what they're saying. But I hope uh, people that um, uh, hear you, they not only hear what you're saying, but they hear your passion. I mean, because you have no skin in the game to lie about these issues. I mean, to mask issues, you're saying it because you've seen it. And there are so many parallels you're able to draw from. If not now, hopefully in the next five or 10 years, they'll look back and say, wow, she said this on May 5th or 6th, I, I, I forget the date, 2022, how true it was. 
So she, the takeaway from so many who have lived through this communist revolution is that it appears that communists are now emboldened to commence the end game against America. They have adopted the terminology of being woke and high-minded sounding words like critical race theory, but it's still the same old playbook of the four overlapping stages of communist revolution. First, demoralize the society. Second, bring about societal division and destabilization. Third, bring on crisis and collapse. And yeah, fourth, crisis, bring about yeah. a new normalization of the communist and mm -hmm. make it look very, very normal. So I think that's you what happened. Uh, you, yeah. you summarized it very well. We are at the end of the uh, minute. Uh, she, please let our viewers know if you think that if there are any last minute parting words. Oh, I, I still have to say, um, courage. Well, if you, at, at least if you understand what's going on, and if you agree that what's going on is a matter of life and death of America, then you need, we all need a little bit more courage. Yep. So uh, she absolutely, I think you inspired me enough to be a little more courageous than what I am right now. I appreciate you for being agreeing to be part of this important session. I mean, you are, you are the embody of courage. And I think uh, you literally started off being saying that not only be courageous, but resist. Resist is important. Think it through of why, what is happening. Your insight and perspective is invaluable at a time when our community needs to hear it. I think we all need to hear this. And I, I'm telling you, Americans have overcome many daunting challenges through us, throughout their nation's past, often waking up in the 11th hour before taking action and then prevailing too. I think protecting our citizens' freedom and saving America as a beacon of freedom in the world should be your and my priority as being an immigrant. And you are taking your job very seriously. Absolutely. And every single time I've seen you on screen, either it is on Fox News or wherever you have been, you speak with the same passion, you speak with the utmost courage. I hope a lot more get inspired, a lot more sees the sees this and uh, continue to follow the path. And at least if nothing, go back and read on it. That's what I would tell younger generation or people that are commenting on Facebook that they don't agree with you. I said, the least we can all do is go back and read on Chinese Cultural Revolution and literally have those two cultures and write down what's happening now and what's, what has happened then. I think that would be phenomenal. So I, again, thank you so much. I appreciate you joining us on Conversations That Count. I hope this was uh, uh, this was a joyful experience for you to kind of talk about what's going on as well. Yes, thank you so much for uh, to uh, have me a part of the conversation. Thank you. So viewers, you've seen she as part of May's Asian American Pacific Islander Month. If you see any Asian American, please thank them for our contributions. Um, uh, she has been a warrior. Sometimes when she, she says this, some may not agree, but you just have to agree to disagree, disagree to agree. Uh, and then kind of try to find out what the truth is. Uh, that being said, I am going to have Han Kao, his Captain Kao, who is running for Congress tomorrow um, at six o'clock right here at Conversations That Come. Right. He will be talking about his upcoming race. And uh, if you are part of 11th Congressional District, please know that tomorrow is uh, we are going to be electing our chairman of 11th Congressional District and also our candidate for 11th Congressional District. So if you are around, please come out and vote. All the information is on Fairfax GOP. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 6 p.m. right here on Conversations That Count uh, to speak to Captain, uh, Captain Kao. He's also going to talk to us a little bit about Vietnamese culture and why he's such a passionate American and why he's running for Congress. I wish you all a very good evening, whether you agree or not agree. Thank you for being engaged. That's all we ask for. Continue to be engaged with us. We'll try to bring warriors like she more and more. Have a wonderful uh, um, evening. God bless you all and God bless America.